you don't really learn something or you don't really like yeah. um, have a good grasp of it until you've had to like create something with it. Welcome everybody to the 33rd episode of the Go Sell Cloud podcast. I've got with me Austin Calton, who's a front-end developer, and we're going to focus on that subject matter. All right, let's get into it. First question, nuts and bolts, what do you do as a front-end developer? What's what's your life like? Being a front-end developer, you're, you're really focusing on the front-end, so the client side of websites, so what the users are actually interacting with, and that would be you know, anything visual that you see that you can click on, that you can interact with, um, you know, the, the front end can be as simple as just the design and the layout of the website and, you know, the way that uh, images and text and stuff like that appear on the homepage. Or, you know, it can also pertain to the functionality side of things. So let's say you've got, uh, you know, some kind of call to action button. And when that's clicked, that triggers a form or some kind of pop up to appear and take over the screen. And maybe it plays a video or, or maybe it's just a lead form. Front end development would kind of encompass all of that in terms of the the design, the structure, the layout, and that functionality as well being there to provide the the different interactions across the website. So basically, everything that a user sees and everything a user interacts with. Yep, yep, totally. That's definitely like the the most simple definition you can give it for sure. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit more specifically and a little bit more technologically about core technologies behind that front end development? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, you know, if you if you Google anything about front end development or web development, you know, you're bound to come across a lot of uh, buzzwords that you probably have no idea what they mean. You know, there's there's a dime a dozen uh, what we call libraries and frameworks that exist that have, you know, um, risen and fallen over the years. Um, You know, some of the ones that are popular right now would be um, Vue, which is one that we use internally on, Mm -hmm. on some of our products. Uh, React is another popular one that you probably have seen in, in your research, but essentially those those frameworks are built around a, a core technology, which is uh, JavaScript. Mm-hmm. So you know, as long as um, you know, for for a long time now, JavaScript has been the, the essential programming language that allows for any kind of like interaction, um, any kind of dynamic interaction to happen on a website. So outside of JavaScript, you've got HTML and you've got CSS. Um, and those two are kind of, uh, those aren't programming languages, but they're, they're languages in, in the sense that they have a, a specific like way that you have to write them um, for it to be valid and for it to work. If we wanted to make an analogy to like the room we're in right now, mm-hmm. you know, the HTML w- would essentially be the structure behind the, the walls here. So we can't see like the framing or anything like that. But, you know, if, if we could, like we've, we've got, you know, framing for a wall, you know, to your right and all around us. Right now, and and that's essentially what creates the the structure of this room, the way that it looks. And then the next kind of layer to that would be the CSS. The CSS could be analogous to like the the paint. Um, if you have decorations and things like that, like the posters here behind us, that's kind of like the layer of of design that sits on top of that structure and gives it a little bit of a pop, so that it's not so dry and bland looking. And and CSS has evolved so much over the years in terms of how you know. The, the simple things that you were able to do starting out versus now, you know, in, incorporating a lot more, um, a lot more things that you used to have to lean on JavaScript to do, um, like animations um, is, is a good, good example. So you can do a lot of animating mm-hmm. with, with CSS now, which means you don't have to necessarily be, you know, the, the most expert JavaScript programmer um, if you know, you know, your um, analog to some of those JavaScript methods in in CSS that allow you to, to achieve the same things that you're trying to achieve. So that's that's probably how it would, would connect those two. And then to go back to that analogy, if you bring JavaScript in into the play, the JavaScript would be kind of like the the electrical wires that are like, you know, behind the walls, part of the um, part of the structure. So like if you go over and flip a light switch, you're you're interacting with this room right now, you know, and that's gonna have an effect. The lights are gonna turn off or the lights are going to turn on. So, so JavaScript would be kind of what sits in the background. It's not really visible only until you start interacting with things. And you notice when you, when you do something over here, this thing changes yep. and JavaScript is, is the reason that that's happening. So like if you click in a, a button an accordion pops open yeah. in your view, that's an example of JavaScript doing its job. Yep, exactly. Although CSS now can do more and more of that. 
Yeah, yeah. CSS can definitely like be, you can lean on that a lot more than you used to be able yeah. to, which is really good because CSS is very fast. Um, you know, our, our our browsers like are are parsing all of this code, and so the more that you can lean on CSS to to achieve some animations, um, things like that, the the better. Yeah. But you still do need JavaScript for a large portion of interactions and um, and other things like that. If you have a ton of code that's running behind the scenes, is that creating a clunkier website? Do you know what I mean? Like if you have something that's heavy on, um, so you've got your HTML, your CSS, you've got a light amount of JavaScript, but then once you throw in some secondary technologies, are you creating kind of like a clunkier website? Do you know what I mean? Like there's mm -hmm. more technology that's running all the time. So people are getting a slower experience or, or is it, it's so light as code that that's not necessarily a problem? That's a good question. I think our websites that, that, that we're working on, they do have a lot of like third party tools that are active on them, um, but there's things that developers can do. So um, developers at these other companies that are producing the third party tools to, uh, to allow the code to run efficiently and not hold up maybe the load time of, yeah. of the page. That's, that's like a real key thing, you know, is when you're, when you're writing code, um, a lot of times it's about like the timing in, in making sure that you're not blocking the initial rendering of the page with something that's, uh, you know, really computationally intensive. Yep. And so there's ways and techniques in, in programming, um, you know, that, that allow you to, to defer things like that. And so, you know, on the one hand, you, you do have a lot of stuff, you know, depending upon the type of website that you have, you know, what your, um, what, what your user is going to be doing in the website. Yep. There's a lot of, interaction going on on our websites a lot of uh, a lot of tools that have to exist because the clients need um, you know tools like chat chat tools they need um, lead form tools that that connect users to the ability to, to get financing for vehicles um, you know a lot of use cases like that that, that require these third-party tools to to be on our website so it's kind of a you know a, a situation of you, you have to have you know those those third-party tools there out of out of necessity sometimes yep. um, and, you know, as much as we have control over like the, the code and stuff that we write, we do, we do focus on trying to um, be as efficient as possible as we're, as we're coding out the websites to our, uh, to our best degree to make sure that they load fast. You know, a good example of that would be if you're building, um, if you're building a component that has a lot of like image assets in it, then, then what you would want to do is use a technique called lazy loading, where if it's not above the fold on the website, if it's below the fold, then the, then the browser is not going to load that image content right away. So it's not going to hold up the initial load of the website just for something that's not even in view, basically. Yep. Um, and that's that's a great thing because that that definitely can allow the websites to load much faster than if you hadn't cho uh, chosen to do that. So that's that's one thing that, that we implement on, on our websites across the board um, to make sure that they're they're performing really well and, and loading well. Um, I would say, you know, another thing, now that I'm on the front end development team, because I yeah. started out on, on the website team, so I didn't have access to kind of the, the back end of, of the websites um, to that extent. So now that I'm on this side of things, um, another thing that's important is trying to, you know, render the right amount of content um, from, the, from the server side. So I guess a good way to think about it would be uh, a form, for example, um, would be something consistent, like across yeah. all of our websites. Yeah, so maybe definitely. we have a contact form that mm -hmm. like all of our websites have. And then within that contact form in our platform that um, manages kind of the the control side of, of what displays on that form page, there might be like, you know, four or five different fields that could be toggled on and off, like like on that form. And so um, the, the ideal way to set things up would be to, on the server side, look at those attributes, look at their values, and based on those values, render the the subset of those four or five fields in that form yep. into the page versus rendering maybe all of the, the yeah. form fields and then using JavaScript or CSS to like hide to the ones that you don't need, yep. you know, on, on the front end. So sometimes, you know, you, you may get into a situation where you, where you have to render all the content and you have to selectively hide things with CSS after the fact. So yep. after the page, um, you know, ap after the, uh, um, the page has been requested and loaded, so on the front end side of things, but if you can do it on the back end, that's that's always good to be able to selectively render um, what you need as best you can without having to lean on JavaScript or you know CSS to selectively hide and show things on the front end side of things. But you, it does seem like you are trying to constantly balance 
efficiency mm -hmm. in code and programming. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, efficiency is, is definitely something that's that's always you know front of mind with with what you're doing. And and the more that you the more that you learn, um, you know, through various resources about ways that you can go about doing things, yeah. you know, the your your um, ability to do things more efficiently is going to grow. You know, over time, like somebody that has been doing web development much longer than me probably has you know more ideas of, of techniques that can be used or better ideas for techniques that can be used that I may not be aware of just yet. You know, I'm constantly trying to, uh, to develop my knowledge and, and stay up to date on, on the best ways to, to handle certain situations and yep. the best way to go about things. But, but yeah, it's, there's so much information out there that, you know, um, you're just, you're constantly learning and that's, what's fun about it. You know, like I might do something today and then I learn tomorrow, Oh, this is actually a more efficient way to do what I did yesterday. And so then I know, okay, I can go back and update what I had, which yep. is nice. And then also going forward, I know to do things this way instead. It kind of plays into, to the question that I was going to ask about ways that you're continuing to evolve, like as a student of the profession, so to speak, like yeah. that you're trying to keep abreast of emerging technologies or developments or all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about like a few sources of inspiration for, for you yeah. in that way? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think uh, one of the most tangible things like that, that anybody could kind of dip into to, to kind of keep their knowledge up to date, there's a lot of email newsletters, um, you know, that you can sign up for. And you don't necessarily have to read those email newsletters every single day, but it's great to have something like that that kind of curates some of the most, um, you know, trending uh, stories of the day or of the week, Definitely. depending upon how often they're distributed so that you don't have to go out and find that stuff all on your own. And then out of those curated stories, maybe you only read like, like, you know, a couple or something, you're not reading the whole thing, but that is, is so much better than, you know, doing nothing every single day and just kind of allowing your, your knowledge to, to remain stagnant. So I think those are great, um, you know, great foot in the door for being able to, to learn more about, your, your profession, web development, and, and being able to grow your skills. And I think on top of that, you know, there's, um, there's, there's so many good, like, course websites that you can get involved with, you know, depending upon what you feel like your, your strong skill set is and then what areas of your skill set need a little bit more, like, um, fortification, you know, and, and, and growth in, in some form of, like, tutorial. So there's, uh, there, there's, there's a number of those out there. I think one of my favorite ways to... Um, keep my knowledge up to date outside of some of those would also be podcasts. Um, I've got a specific one that I listen to that's called syntax FM and I've listened to those guys for, for a while. And, and what I really like about them, you know, on the one hand they feel, you know, that, that they're knowledgeable about the craft and, and the things that they talk about, because you can, you can take what they say and you can go read other articles or, you know, things in the newsletters, like I was talking about, and you can compare and you can know, you know, are they on, are they on track, you know, outside of the fact that, that they have a, a large following and, you know, um, you know, just a, just a big audience. Um, but I also like the, just the, the mindset that they bring to talking about programming. I feel like they're very growth minded and, and very encouraging in terms of don't ever get discouraged when, when you go and, and try to research and, you know, grow more in your skill set. that sometimes doing that, you find out about more things and more things that you don't know. And that can feel like you're really loading yourself down with that stuff. But, yep. but they're, you know, super adamant about like being, becoming really good at the basics and then everything else from there, you know, is, is going to build. And, and they do a great job of covering all the, um, the latest trends in technologies and frameworks and things like that and, and recapping that for you. Um, so I'd say that in addition to just their, their positivity. And the other thing that was cool that I didn't realize at first when I started listening to them uh, was one of the guys I think used to work at, at Ford. And so listening to some of the projects that he talks about um, having done, you know, in the past for Ford, it's kind of cool to, to have that, you know, analog to, to what we do on a daily basis for the automotive website. So definitely uh, made me appreciate the podcast a little bit more finding that out. Sometimes there's that picture of the developer as the, the lonely hero, like typing out code. What do you think about like the relationship with others in your field, either in your department, in your company or outside it? How important is that for you? Or do you feel like, no, I'm kind of a lone wolf. That's how I like to work on this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I'm, that's that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. I think uh, being able to rely on other people is, is super important in this because, you know, there's a lot of times where you just can get to a point trying to take initiative on your own and you get stuck and you just need a little bit of help, you know, to, to get past whatever that roadblock is currently. Um, so I would definitely, you know, 
ad- advise people to, to have that kind of mindset. It's, it's definitely easy to, to kind of fall into to the lone wolf mentality sometimes and feel like, you know, everybody else has got a lot of work to do, you know, because when you're doing this kind of work, you, you know, sometimes things are easy and straightforward and you can knock them out and really get some momentum. And sometimes you really get uh, a problem that requires you to, to think on it for a while. And just like the planning out about how you're going to go about a solution can take up a lot of your time, yep. you know, and, and, and so when you think about what that's like for you, it's easy to think like, okay, these other people that I could go ask for help with, they're really busy or they're bogged down too. So let me not bother them. And, and I've definitely been there plenty of times, but, yeah. but I think overall, like there's, there's so many good people here at, at, at SoCal on the, on the technology team, on the developer team that have, have helped me, you know, immensely for sure. And, and I think that's, that's just something that we all have to like get over and, and just realize yeah. like you're always going to be in a place of either feeling like you're going to bother somebody else by helping them. Yep. Or you're going to be on the other end of things and somebody feels like they're bothering you, you know, trying to ask you for help, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, something cyclical that no matter how far along in your in your dev career, I feel like you could be on either either end of of, of the spectrum of that, you know. And I think as long as you're somebody that that doesn't just, you know, take no initiative in in the direction of solving the problem you're trying to solve. If you show like the person like, hey, I've tried these things and and I'm kind of still stuck you know, about like my, my next direction, then, then I think everybody, you know, is, is willing to, to help here at SoCal at least and everybody that I've approached and, and, and kind of point you in the right direction or really help you get, get out of whatever it is that, that you're stuck in. So I think, uh, I think definitely it's teamwork is teamwork is huge. Yeah. I think it's positive or productive to sweat it out for a while Yeah, until you really, really, really hit a roadblock and you're, mm-hmm. and you're just like, Hey, it doesn't hurt. Like I can ask for help. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to be seen as stupid. I've, I've thought about this in every single way. Totally. Totally. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is standups because I didn't know about standups before. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted you to maybe define what standups are and then talk a little bit more about the day to day nitty gritty of what you're doing, prototyping, you name it. Just go through kind of like what your job is like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. No, that's, uh, that's a good question you know, as far as standups go. So standups, yeah. like the format is just a really concise meeting with you and your direct team. And in those, the point of those is to kind of share what you're working on. So everybody talks about what they're working on currently. And in hopes that, you know, if you're stuck on something, kind of going back to the teamwork point that we were talking about earlier, yep. somebody else in the meeting, maybe they have knowledge of, of something that is going to help you out or help, help you move along, you know? Um, or, you know, if, if, uh, if, priorities change, which that happens all the time, right? Like something that was a priority last week is now second priority this week because we got this other thing that we got to get fixed first. So those standups just allow you that space to kind of chat with the rest of your team and figure out who's working on what and distribute those, you know, or distribute the work, you know, in, in, in an efficient way where you're still kind of maintaining whatever the most priority work is, getting that done first, moving on to your next stuff and, you know, getting out of a problem if you're stuck with it. Um, so it's, so it's, you know, really useful for that. And we do those like two to three times a week usually. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And it's not, even though maybe the term originated with a literal stand up meeting, which meant it had to be quick because people were standing, mm-hmm. you guys don't have to stand like it's correct. Yeah. We're, we're not standing. Ours are, uh, <laughs> ours are done via zoom. So everyone is sitting down, but you're right Relaxed. about, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. You're, uh, you're right about the, the history though. I remember reading that and I was like, that's, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the purpose is, is a really unique idea. Yeah, yeah. Because then totally. you're like forcing people to be concise and like what's the most absolute pressing matter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you need, you know, we all need that accountability. Like no matter how self-disciplined uh, yeah. we think we are at times, I feel like that, you know, that coincides with like the momentum you have in the work you're doing. Like are you are you struggling to like, you know, get that creative spark to like kick off a project that you've taken on? You know, sometimes that's Definitely. the problem is like, I, you know, I'm really struggling as far as like what the starting point should be, you know, and, and sometimes talking with other people can, can spark that creativity in you. Or, or if you just share, like, here's like a rough idea of like what I have laid out that I'm planning to, um, where, as far as where I'm planning to take this project or, or this new component or whatever I'm working on. That's great to share that with the team because you can get their feedback. And, And a lot of times, you know, people are going to see things about the way you thought about doing something in a different light to where, you know, it, it helps you account for 
you know, potential issues down the road yeah. ahead of time and think about edge cases that, that you might not have thought about and things like that. So, so yeah, it's definitely great to have those standups for a lot of reasons and, um, and, and for sure to, to kind of help like jumpstart the, the creativity sometimes. And, you know, uh, we use, we use some Adobe tools. We use uh, Figma. Figma's, you know, probably something that I lean on a good bit. Um, it's, it's similar to, um, Adobe has, uh, XD or at XD. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, so Tim, our uh, design developer that, uh, you know, he, he's on the front end team as well. Yeah. He focuses more on the, the wireframing, the mockups, that, that kind of side of, of the front end, um, development. And so, you know, I know he uses XD and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll use that, but I tend to use Figma just, just out of like, uh, you know, what, what works for me. Um, and that's great to just be able to slap together like a quick prototype or, or, you know, even just like a rough, a really rough idea concept of like just screenshots organized together of like what you're going for. Yep. And, and sometimes we'll have meetings where he takes something like that and, and can really run with it and go into a, a really in-depth design. And, and, and we get to a point where it's like, oh, we know exactly what this page is going to look like from, from the design. And now my job as like the, the front end developer on like the coding side of things is to build that. Um, that design out one to one, you know, make it make it pixel perfect on the website. So take it from just something that's static, that's kind of like an image at the end of the day, to yeah. something that exists on our client websites that can be interacted with and, and have all of those like functionalities that we talked about earlier. And that's and that's really fun. A lot of times, it's nice to have like the the job kind of divided like that, where you where you have you know your certain responsibilities depending upon what the project is like. But other times, you know, given the the size of our team. You have to wear both hats and you have to take a project from, you know, creating the initial concept of, of maybe what something is going to look like and how things are going to be laid out and then also building it out. So it's good to have like it's good to have both of those skill sets for sure. Yeah. But I would say at the end of the day, um, you know, people tend to, to be stronger for sure in, in, in one or the other. And it's and it's you know such a blessing to have a team that, you know, where everybody has varying skill sets that really complement each other like that at the end of the day. Definitely. Yeah. For people who don't know, can you just briefly tell me what prototyping is mm -hmm. and how useful that is in the web development process? Yeah, yeah, totally. I would say, you know, prototyping in terms of the context of what we do, you know, people might have different definitions of exactly what that looks like. But for us, sometimes that can just be like a mock-up that we've developed. And, and now within Adobe and Figma, it, within the mock-ups, you can actually create, you know, a, a light uh, version of some interaction on those mockups. So you can, you can have like two artboards, you know, or however many you've got, and you can, you know, set up an interaction between your first one and, and how it's going to connect to the next several. So if somebody clicks on this part of that board, then it takes them to this board. And so it kind of, kind of gives you like the, uh, the feel of like a, a light prototype that you're interacting with something past just looking at like a, a static image. So that's really nice. And sometimes, you know, a prototype really just consists of that at the end of the day. Other times, you know, uh, we might be working on a component that really requires you to kind of dip a little bit more into the, the technical side of, of how it's going to function and maybe explore a little bit of the capabilities that, that we have, like with, uh, with, with the data that we have um, to display on websites. So, for instance, you know, if it's like um, something we worked on uh, last year for the NADA conference that ended up making it on to all of our uh, dealer websites was the uh, the tab search filter that has the the multiple tabs and within that you've got your different filters that you can interact with to to shop for vehicles um, and so one of those that that kind of was more of a working prototype that ended up like a version of it being built out on like a, a test website yeah. past the mock-up involved kind of the idea of of how we would template in images for the models tab um, and so, you know, I, I kind of roughed out like just a, a library of images on that on that website and kind of templated templated them in uh, via JavaScript just to kind of see how, you know, how smooth we could get that to be, yeah. um, you know, what the interaction and all would would kind of look like combining, you know, the, the design and the shape of the way that filter was supposed to look with kind of how we could get those images to work into that, you know, and look nice, look clean, look modern. And so that, that was a good, um, you know, example of like a prototype that we had like a, you know, static version inside Adobe XD. And then we took it to a, a staging website where we actually build out 
a good bit of it, you know, um, most of the final component probably existed in that prototype. And then once you go from prototype to final, you know, that, that change often involves just, you know, refining the code that you've written. So a lot of times while you're coding, you know, one of the most important things you're worrying about is not repeating yourself, you know, with like the, uh, more so with like the, the JavaScript, um, or, uh, Ruby that you're writing. Ruby is the, the backend language that, that our platform runs on. So you're, you're trying to think at the time as you're building things, it is what I'm doing something that is going to be reusable. And so I, I'm going to define it in a different way, you know, so that if I ever have to go back and change it or update it, I don't have like five places that it exists. I have one, you know, and they're all referencing that, that one core place where I've defined it just like as a simple way to think about it. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, you, you, you can, you know, have a good concept of that up front. And then other times I feel like as you get to the prototyping phase and you've got everything built out and, and structured, then you're like, okay, it makes sense to, to maybe take these few pieces and make them more modular and then set like one reference point for those few pieces to, to reference and not, uh, you know, not multiple. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines of not repeating yourself so that at the end of the day, really you just want your, you want your code base to be readable and understandable so that, you know, somebody other than you is having to make an update to something they yep. can easily jump into it and understand how it works. And it's not all just like something that was arbitrarily made up in your head at the end of the day. And that's where a lot of like the frameworks come into play that we talked about earlier. Yeah. You know, there's there's conventions that each of those frameworks follow that kind of allow you to write code in a structured way. And so if everybody is familiar with that framework, then everyone is going to be familiar with the the structure of whatever you produce at the end of the day. And it's going to make the the maintenance of that code base a lot, you know, a lot more uh, easy than, than it would be if you weren't following any kind of convention or anything like that. So that's uh, that that's you know, something that's super important in, in what we do. Um, and, and definitely like, um, you know, just, just a, a, a valuable aspect of, of being a developer, always kind of having that maintainability, um, and scalability in mind when, when you're doing things, if you have a desire to, to kind of optimize things, you can always go back, at least in the code side of things, you know, you can, you can go back and you can, you know, when you, when you have some, some free time, you know, in between projects or, yeah. or maybe you're doing something that's a new request, but it's related to a project you did in the past and you have that chance to review that, that code that you wrote and you see like, oh, given what I know now about the, this framework or just the knowledge that I've gained since I did this, I think it's important. Like you don't have to strive for perfection whenever you're building something, yeah. but if you always have the, the mindset of like, whenever I have a chance to, to make something more efficient and a lot of times it's like, you know, me and what I did last month or last year or whatever versus what I'm doing today. I think that's, that's a really important thing. Cause you get to see that you get to see that progress in your growth as a developer. Yep. And then also you get the satisfaction of knowing the thing that you made is, is better than it was the first time. What, what's your favorite tool? So to speak, you've got mm. a lot that you shared with me, fi, um, Adobe software, the suite, Figma, Fig Jam, VS code, browser stack. You also mentioned libraries, um, but I don't know if that's the same kind of um, category, but you've got Bootstrap, jQuery, Vue. Is that like Vue.js or something? Or is it Vue? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. And then Rails. Is that Ruby on Rails or is it? Yep, just yep. Rails? so Rails is like the framework that uh, we we write our Ruby code within okay. for, for our website application. Yep. So I guess out of all those like core technologies in mm -hmm. web development, what's your favorite and why? Like all the ones that we just named, like yeah. top of mind is is like the... Uh, the more like design oh, oriented okay. software. So that would be like Figma, Adobe, um, Fig Jam, I think I put in there. Fig yep. Jam is, is like a like a subset file type that's more like a collaborative whiteboarding tool oh, that, okay. that Figma makes. Yeah. Nice. Um, and so I think I'd put that one up there as of lately because it's just really capable in terms of allowing you to have that collaboration with people who are remote, you know, that you're not physically um, present with. So so you can kind of walk through problems together, like in a common common space, and it's really nice because I feel like the, you know, it's just it's really versatile. So I, you know, for instance, if we're trying to figure out like a bug for for you know, um, or figure out a solution to a bug, um, you know, you can take screenshots and drop them into that whiteboarding tool. So that that might be screenshots of whatever is going wrong on the website. So that way everybody knows, you know, outside of just words on like yeah. an email or something like that, here's exactly what we're talking about. Here's exactly. the problem. So everybody can see it and, and visualize it. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, it's got a lot of like widgets and, and different things like that that you can embed in it. So another really helpful aspect of that 
collaboration tool is being able to drop in like a code widget. And when you're working with somebody through, you know, here's, here's the issue, here's some code that, that oh, I'm yeah. testing that, that seems like it might fix it. That that's super helpful to be able to like share that instantly in that medium right next to, to the screenshot or right next to the conversation you've got going on in there. And, you know, fixing issues or bugs is one thing. It's super helpful also. And just like going from like a, like a mock-up, you could drop in a yeah. mock-up as well and kind of have like a, a, a chat going with whoever else is, is in the document with you and, and talk about things you like and don't like. And, and maybe you can make some recommendations to the person who might be like working on building that out via that code tool yep. as well. So you can drop in some code and say, Hey, when you get to this part, here's like a specific way I would, I would write the, the CSS, the styling yep. for this, you know? Yep. And that's nice because you don't have to like send links back and forth to different tools or things like that. Everything can kind of be in one place. And that's what I, that's what I like about it a lot. And, you know, uh, just, just the overall collaboration, like they, they have other stuff in there that, you can make use of uh, that Fig Jam tool for, you know, just just fun hangout sessions with your team and stuff like that. That's something that, that I think uh, we'll probably end up taking advantage of more. A lot of different things, yeah. you know, whether it's like directly useful to what you're working on or whether it's, you know, uh, tangent to that with just building good, you know, um, community with your team. I wanted to also <laughs> say that that ChatGPT has been a very helpful tool. Like when you say favorites, I'm, I'm thinking about things yeah. that, that have been relevant to me most recently. Um, that, that's been great to just consolidate the process that you have as a developer sometimes when you're trying to troubleshoot an issue, yep. um, you know, with, with something you're working on. So typically you might, you might research on Google, um, like a, an error or something that you're trying to resolve and you're reading through forums of other people who have also posted having that same issue yeah. and what worked for them, what fixed it for them, you know, and you're, you're taking that and, and trying to apply any fixes or any insights that you gain from that stuff yep. to the code you're writing. And ChatGPT is, is so helpful because a lot of times, you know, the, the same, that same process, you can just, you know, have that play out in terms of the dialogue with, with ChatGPT, almost as if you were talking to like a, a tutor or, or some kind of teacher or something like that. And so I think uh, that's been super helpful for me at times to just, you know, reduce that, that manual searching time down Definitely. and, and, you know, be able to iterate off of like you get a fix and, and maybe, you know, maybe it, get, it provides you with with something that, uh, you know, oh, that that reminds me there's another way to do it that I think might be better. Yeah. You know? And so it really helps you to iterate a lot faster than you otherwise would be able to manually having to kind of gain those insights from a multitude of articles and forums and things like that, you know, when you're when you're programming. So I love that about it. And I think as I try to continue to um, increase my skills and, and learn more in different areas across across the board for front end development, I think, you know, for anybody that that's like a, a super helpful thing to reach for, not to lean on, you yeah. know, where like you want to just take everything out of it and not even think about, you know, you never want to do that. You never want to just grab from that and, and dump it into whatever code you're writing and, and not even think twice about, okay, what is the, what, what, that it gave me, what is that actually doing? You know, I think it's really important to, to see it as like a, an assistive technology yep. to your workflow, not a replacement for a lot of things that, that you just still don't take the time to think through. So as long as you're using it with that, you know, disclaimer in mind, I, th I think it's great. It can be really helpful. And also, you know, working, working at a company and using it, you just have to be mindful about what are you, what are you plugging into it? You know, um, yep. you know, in terms of code and stuff like that. Most of the time, when I use it, it's very small. You know, bits of code that are, you know, open source, general purpose type things. You know, like I'm trying to. I have, you know, let's say an example would be like I have these four or five different car models, and so maybe each of those models has like a handful of attributes. You know, and yep. I'm trying to loop over that set of models in pull out or, or maybe extract just the ones that, that satisfy this particular criteria, you know? So that's an example of something that's really generic. That's kind of, you know, uh, not like a security risk or anything like that, uh, that, that, that you would need to be cognizant of when using it. That's something that's really generic and it's kind of like just a, uh, general purpose problem that chat GBT can be really helpful for sometimes. A couple last ones and then do like rapid fire questions for the remaining ones. Okay. Um, Okay, let's say you're not a professional developer. Maybe you are. What do you think, what's your overall opinion of no dev 
um, web platforms. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no code. No code tools. No code the no tools. Co- the no code yeah. movement. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? Just like ChatGPT, like depending upon the project that you're working on, like we've had some client projects where it has made sense to build them out in, in those no code tools. Yep. And so I think they're, they're a great resource to use depending upon what project you're given, um, you know, what, what task is at hand essentially. So they're not a full replacement for all the things that you can do as a developer. You know, if you're, if you're interested in becoming a developer, um, you know, front end or back end or whatever, it's, it's always going to be helpful to be knowledgeable about how to, to write code because, you know, you're, you're getting to choose how to deploy like the, the raw tools at the end of the day to build whatever you need. So if you pursue, you know, if you pursue learning about web development, even in the, you know, the current environment of, of the growth and the popularity of these no code tools, it's always going to be beneficial. You know, it's always going to, to provide you an edge over other people that only are, are constrained in terms of what they can do um, in web development if they're, if they're just restricted to like working within platforms like that. But if you can figure out how yeah. to leverage them in, in a way that saves you time, just like anything else, I think, at the end of the day. So I don't have a super strong opinion of it one way or another. I kind of see it as like a, like a tool like Figma or Adobe as just something that aids my workflow, yeah. saves me some time depending upon what the project is that, that needs to be done um, and can be helpful and and just try to look at it like that. Yeah, I do know, too, that, that you're doing code injections and in a lot of those, too, or you have the ability to, too. So, like, yeah. if you know to how to speak the language, that's going to really help you a lot. That's going to give you part of that edge. Totally, totally. That's a great point because one of our client projects, like, we were able to build out most of the, um, you know, most of the website entirely in the um in the no code tool, Webflow is the one we were using. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a portion of it that required, you know, a, a little bit of extra JavaScript to bring into fruition. And, you know, and that was just a, a simple page that allowed you to sort and filter different listings that they were showing on that page. And so yeah. that's something that, you know, um, historically, like in platforms like this, there's plugins that people develop sometimes. So what that is would just be kind of like a, like an extension in your Google Chrome browser, something yeah. that's auxiliary to you. I guess the, the default set of uh, utilities that, that you get in the platform that you have to add on to, to do a certain thing. So if you have knowledge of how to create something like that, yeah. you know, from scratch, then that can be really helpful to to supplement all the work that you're doing inside the platform and, and the amount of time that it's saving you on, you know, just general layout problems like how to how to lay out pictures and images and stuff on onto a, a page in a way that's, you know, visually appealing. Yep. You can do that a lot faster, you know, with um you know, with, with the utilities and the, and the interface that exist in those uh, no-code tools sometimes. Overall, what are the steps that you're taking on a day-to-day base, basis to optimize sites for, you know, speed and functionality? On our end of things, on the front-end team, like when you're building yeah. new components, um, keeping in line with, like, constraints that have been built in for uh, pre-existing components. So, for instance, it might be, like, you have a, a component that's like a slider that can handle an image, we've got constraints on how large that image can be for a particular slider. And so having knowledge of these are um, components that exist that are similar to what you're doing and pay attention to the constraints and kind of the convention that, you know, the previous developers have have built into the application, making sure you're continuing to maintain that in the new stuff that gets built. So I think being mindful about conventions and and practices that you have internally like that for for a specific example are are a good way to, you know, just get in the habit of, of, um, building in that mindset to, to be thinking about efficiency and performance and things like that with whatever you're doing. Yep. What kind of technique are you employing on a day to day, like kind of checklist style to make sure that things are working cross format, cross layout, transitional into phone versus desktop, horizontal versus vertical, whatever. First, first off, when you say that, uh, it makes me think of like when, when we're trying to troubleshoot something in a, in a helpful tool like cross platform where you can kind of emulate like different devices yeah. and different browsers is browser stack. That one that I mentioned, um, that that's really nice to be able to test the, the websites like in, in almost any kind of like environment that you can think yeah. of, which is helpful when you only have so many physical devices on hand with mm-hmm. you. So that one's super powerful in terms of, of helping, um, you know, debug issues that come up because there's a, there's a weird compatibility issue that we just, you know, didn't have the knowledge of. And so we can go test it in there and figure out, okay, this is what's breaking down and what's the the fix for it to kind of patch it and, 
and, and do the best we can to get that out quickly. Yeah. So that one's a super helpful tool for, for testing. Um, also, you know, you can, can totally be used in the workflow, like, you know, when creating new things and kind of running it in there and making sure that the, the, the stuff that you built behaves as you expect across the board, you Definitely. know, um, there, there's a lot of times where, um, issues just come up that for whatever reason are just a, a, a weird edge case that you, you didn't think to even test or replicate ahead of time. So that goes back to kind of like what we were talking about, um, in the beginning of, of striving for like perfection versus knowing that you're striving for the, the best thing possible, still got to meet deadlines and get things out the door yep. with the knowledge that you can always go back and you can refine the things that you've already, you know, um, published and put out, yep. um, because you're always, you're always learning more that, that allows you to, to go back and do the things you did yesterday better. Inside Chrome is another, um, another tool that's yeah. really helpful in terms of testing different, uh, layouts and things like that. So I'd say that's something that, that I make use of a good bit because that's got, you know, built in, um, device sizes, sizes within it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get a feel really quick for yeah. whatever you're building, you know, is it, is it going to work across the board for desktop and mobile? Okay. You need to change something for desktop that, you know, um, needs to be sized differently or, or vice versa for mobile. That one's really helpful for just, uh, seeing that, you know, really quickly, um, and, and kind of jumping from one view to the next every time, you know, whenever you do a change that might have a, an effect across the board like that. So yep. I would say that one and, and browser stack have been my main two, uh, tools to kind of work into my, my workflow in terms of testing as I think most of our traffic comes from Google Chrome and Safari, you know, so we're always testing stuff in those two browsers primarily, and then leading on browser stack, maybe for, for some of the more like, um, Android mobile type type browsers and, and that type of testing Definitely. that we mm -hmm. what about coding for people with disabilities? How are you how often are you checking in on the stuff you're making to make sure that it's got readability for people who maybe have impairments or anything like that? It always should be something that factors into what we're building on our websites and it definitely does. You know, yep. for instance, um, the filter we were talking about earlier, the the tabbed filter that has the different um, sub filters within it, drop downs and a payment slider and models. Um, so something like that, that has a lot of interactivity in it. Um, something important is that we, we build in the ability to, to still navigate through that without the, the use of a mouse. So you can use a keyboard oh, and you cool. can navigate through that, you know, with, with a keyboard in addition to, you know, using a mouse to, or, or swiping on mobile, um, as, as people typically would. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the structure, a lot of times, like the, the HTML elements that, that you're using to, to build your components with, you know, the, the browser handles a lot of stuff behind the scenes for, um, for accessibility. If you use the right, um, semantic is kind of the term for yeah. elements. So, you know, you might have a, a basic element that can be multi-purpose and used for a lot of stuff like a, like a div, for example, is something like that, that is really general purpose. Um, it, it doesn't really have a specific function. You can use it and style it and, and use JavaScript to create some interactions attached to it in yep. a lot of different ways. But for instance, in that tabbed filter, um, we chose to use input elements because those allow, um, different interactions as a user focuses. So as they're going through, you know, that filter with like a keyboard versus a mouse, yeah. they can, they can still interact with it and they can turn things on and off. And all of that is built into the fact that, um, we, we used an input element there instead of just something basic like a div. So just, I guess, being knowledgeable about the, the right structure to use at the end of the day is, is something really important with that. Definitely. In your years of experience doing dev work, what kind of advice would you possibly be able to pass on to somebody who's just starting out into this career or is thinking about this career? What kind of words could you share with them? Definitely be excited about it because if you think of yourself as a creative person at all, or you like the flexibility of, of having the ability to create. Um, it's a great career for that. It offers a, a lot of opportunity in that area. And it's really fulfilling to kind of like be able to go from thinking about something and then building it and you actually see it in front of you and can play around with it and work with it. So I think it's a really re rewarding, you know, career path to pursue in that aspect. And then, you know, getting started, like I think a lot of things that it could be discouraging to people is just, thinking about how fast the industry progresses, you know, the, the yeah. frameworks, the libraries, you know, they're, they're not always like changing in terms of which one is the most popular, 
that that does happen, you know, historically over the years, but there's always new features that they're releasing. And it feels, you know, I feel like sometimes you could feel overwhelmed with all that you have to feel like you have to have knowledge of to, to do this, you know, and in reality, um, whatever project you're working on, you know, whatever job you're doing, you're going to figure out what your core skills and technologies are that you have to be really adept at, you know? And so let that be the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel that have, have, have good knowledge of a lot of things, but understand that everybody, no matter who you are, you can only be so good at, at a select few things, you know? Yep. And so I think really figuring out what do you want to do within the industry? Like what kind of products do you want to build and work on? That can be a good starting point to, or what kind of companies you want to want to work for. That can be a good starting point to what types of technologies you should try to try to learn, you know, yep. um, languages and um, frameworks and libraries and all of that and, and kind of inform you as you're trying to think of projects. And I think, you know, another thing that's important is just doing work to, to learn better, putting yourself out there. So you can listen to podcasts, you can read articles and you can learn a lot, you know, through, through those means. But a lot of times I feel like you don't really learn something or you don't really like, yeah. um, have a good grasp of it until you've had to like create something with it. Cause when you, whenever you go from like watching somebody else do it or, or listening to somebody talk about how they did something, that's one thing. And, and that gives you some insights. But when you start running into problems in, in like tutorials, trying to build things out and, and, you know, kind of get, get into the nitty gritty of, of the coding side of things, you'll run into to issues that, you know, that person in that podcast didn't talk about, but somebody else probably has. And so you can figure out the, the solution, you know, through researching or working with a tool like ChatGPT to kind of guide you and help you along the way. So I think that's a really important thing is going from, you know, learning and listening to like physically doing things and, yep. and you know, working on projects because you'll also get to see yourself, you know, grow a lot over the time in terms of the knowledge that you had when you did this project versus the knowledge that you have today, you know, yep. and sometimes it feels like like night and day. And the gaps can be large or, you know, they can be smaller. But the important thing is just like making an effort to do that and putting yourself out there, you know, sharing, sharing stuff that that you're working on in terms of personal projects can be great. You know, if you have different discussion forums that you can share stuff on, that's that's got to be a great thing to get that um, the feedback from other people. You know, sometimes it can be like daunting to uh, to share whatever you feel like your knowledge is or your project is with other people, because, you know, you can be afraid of of getting criticism and you know, at the end of the day, if you don't do that, you know, you, you can't, it might hurt to put it out there and get criticized for not knowing something or not doing exactly. something the right way. But if you do that, you know, that thing you didn't know how to do, well, now, now, you know, there's, there's a right way to do it. Yep. And you've, you've learned and you've, you've made that, you know, step that a lot of people will, will try so hard to avoid doing that, you know, and fall behind in terms of being able to progress. So I feel like that's something I'm trying to be better at myself. I'm not naturally good at, you know, taking criticism and and, and putting myself out there like that and being able to just, you know, be comfortable in the fact that I don't have to know everything, you know, but that's something I would, I would definitely encourage people to live by. And, you know, like just with this podcast, I'm sure some of the stuff I said on here, you know, people always have different opinions about right and wrong in, in, in different circumstances and, you know, worrying about being criticized shouldn't hold you back from, from trying to make an effort to, you know, share with people what you think, you know, and just, Definitely. you know, with the mindset that like, Hey, I'm not an expert, you know, yeah. take everything that I say with a grain of salt and understand there's, you know, a lot of different ways to get from A to B in different circumstances yep. and understand that, you know, I'm a person and, and still trying to consistently learn and, and grow and become better and better every day. I think that's healthy, man. I feel like if you're still in school, like the key is to try to see if you can get some career exposure, like, if you can do some freelancing, that's good. Mm-hmm. But just kind of remember that um, you really, really start learning like the first week you're at the job. So it's like you could, I took like a flash course when I was back at the Art Institute. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty adept. Um, this is flash, like way back flash animation, like mm-hmm. a lot of timeline kind of stuff. Yeah, And I, I was like blown away my first week. Um, we had like a Microsoft as one of the clients. And so... They were doing all these phone animations when they had the Microsoft phone. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted that like in ads that they could put on people's screens to show like this is the animation. So we had to recreate it. Uh-huh. I was like, I made it to like 10 p.m. or 10.30 p.m. And I had to call my boss over and be like, dude, you need to help me finish this. This is ridiculous. It's so outside my league. And he helped me like that first week or two. And uh-huh. then I took the initiative 100%. And 
it was one of the best jobs I had. And I, I loved doing it. I loved um, coming to work. And even though it was challenging, and then the whole critique thing that you're mentioning, so, so, so important, yet so hard. But I feel like putting ourselves into painful situations, kind of like scary situations, is so essential to our growth. Mm-hmm. And having our opinions, uh, re- whether it be regarding a design or how we're how we're designing something regarding language or code, having those questioned and moving on from it and say, you're right, that is a better way to think of it. And think of it more of as, as like a global way of approaching our job, you know, like this is my team, this is not just me working on it. I think that's essentially helpful. Yeah, no, so. yeah, I, I would totally agree with you. It sounds like your experience was really rewarding, um, you know, just seeing yourself go from not knowing how to do something to getting through it and then doing it well and being on the other side of things. That's super powerful. And I'm grateful for, for all of those, you know, similar experiences that I've had as well. Definitely is, you know, it is great to have that momentum and go from, you know, one thing to the next and just kind of stay on that as much as you can ride, ride that momentum and, you know, let that be what propels you forward your, your ability to, to continuously change, you know, and not get stuck on yeah, to grow, what you know, to today. love growth, even though it is painful at times. Yeah. yeah. And that there's always an audience for you too. Like, you know, I'm t- you were talking about like sharing your stuff and getting feedback, personal projects, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. There's always an audience for like stuff you're working on. So just mm-hmm. keep sharing. It's it's all good. Yeah. No, that's a great point, man. I totally agree. Thanks, everybody, for checking out uh, the 33rd episode of the Go Soco podcast. I really had a pleasure chatting with you, Austin, today. I hope you had a good time, too. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Thanks. Well, we'll get you on again in a year or so. I'm sure a lot of technology will continue to evolve. But thanks, everybody, and have a great day.